everyone's good, right? Saratoga of Burns, our sole contention is the new frontier of battle. In the status quo, the United States has pulled ground troops out of much of the Middle East and Syria. Tragically, Hubbard of the New York Times finds last month that these conditions have left a power vacuum in the region, spelling the perfect storm for an ISIS resurgence that could potentially kill millions. Thankfully, there is a solution. Offensive cyber operations. Rutzel finds in 2018 that in lieu of more traditional approaches to terror, the Trump administration has authorized the DOD to use offensive operations against global terrorist organizations, which have been crucial in reducing terrorism worldwide. After the recent pull-up ground troops, now is more important than ever to continue cyber operations. Currently, African governments are attempting to develop OCOs in counter-terror efforts as regional terror organizations have used the cyberspace to organize attacks and recruit. Thankfully, Ogun Lala finds in 2019 that the United States has aided African nations by deploying these OCOs through technology transfers, information sharing, and training. He furthers that these OCOs deployed in, Af and deployed in Africa by the United States is what will help African nations give them what they need to combat terror groups in the long run. Additionally, this cooperation also materializes in more effective drone strikes. As Ackerman 19 explains, that current drones are so imprecise that for every one terrorist targeted, 28 civilians are killed. Fortunately, Braillet finds in 2019 that cyber drones are 85% more accurate because their algorithms are able to detect real-time locations of terrorists. Thus, Solmeyer finds that OCOs and drones reduce civilian casualties, which prevent the exacerbation of anti-American sentiment in these countries. These technologies are key as terrorism has severely destabilized Africa. Herbert and Cobb find in 2018 that Boko Haram killed almost 35,000 people and displaced millions, plumbing three-fourths of the country into poverty and putting 5.2 million at the risk of death by starvation. Worse, because of the low cost and convenience of cyber warfare, Beta 19 finds that terrorists are shifting online for recruitment, funding, and attack planning. Fortunately, Vavra 19 finds that the United States OCOs can take out terrorists on a cyber level. In Pierce Group, this is 2017 U.S. cyber attack on ISIS halted their entire digital campaign along with their recruitment capacity, which took years to rebuild. In addition to targeting recruitment bases, these cyber attacks are particularly effective in taking out terrorist funding. Kalamachi 19 explains that ISIS has diversified its portfolio to the point where traditional operations are not sufficient to take out its funding. Fortunately, Sales 19 explains that cyber operations have been used to freeze terrorist assets, and Rogers concludes this has led to a decline in terrorist funding worldwide. Continuing this will be key, as Charlton finds that ISIS has been attempting to recruit expert hackers to infiltrate Western networks, which Dogman finds would likely materialize through an attack on U.S. power bids. This would be devastating, as Pri-15 finds that such an attack would cause a nationwide blackout for a year and kill around 10 million people from starvation. Overall, Vavra further is that the United States is poised to rely much more heavily on offensive cyber operations to control and combat terror groups, which would help reduce terrorism worldwide. This is crucial for three specific reasons. First, to reduce immediate deaths. Mitigating terror is crucial. As Dudley finds in 2018 that in one year alone, terror groups killed almost 20,000 people, and this does not account for deaths by the instability they caused. For example, the Syrian civil war was exacerbated by ISIS, killing 500,000 people. Second is to spur economic growth. Jonas 19 finds that an increase in terrorism decreases FDI by 13.9% because investors see countries as poor investments with heightened terrorism because of the risk of political instability associated with it. Moreover, Ross 19 finds that the purely psychological impacts of terrorism deter FDI from entering these nations. Thus, even if OCOs don't succeed in stopping terrorism and increasing counterterrorism spending, compounded with increased cooperation with the United States gives investors the perceptual confidence they need to increase investment. This is crucial. As Tintin 17 finds, a 10% increase in FDI can increase global can increase GDP by 3.9% for every concurrent <coughs> year. Overall, fueling the investment into Africa is crucial to help globalize their economy. Indeed, Songwe finds that it's just a 7% increase in GDP for Africa can leapfrog them into the, into the development cycle, lifting 400 million people out of poverty. Third is to ensure political stability. Pew 19 finds that terrorist groups have rigged elections in African countries, fueling political instability. Through decreasing terrorism in general would also solve this. Chak Chak 19 explains OCO specifically can protect elections in developing countries, and Baber 19 finds that the United States has the tools necessary to help. Protecting democratic elections is important for two reasons. First, Tagray 14 finds democratic institutions are less prone to conflict as their leaders are more rational, and second, um, democratic institutions have more economic growth because investors are, see a politically stable country as, more, as a better investment. Thank you. Please affirm. Can I see one thing that um, cyber operations have made drones like eighty five percent more effective? Sure. Thank you.
<coughs> Rohan 98 for assault. The benefits of the United States federal government's use of offensive cyber operations outweigh the harms. Our sole contention is preventing an economic catastrophe. Financial institutions across the world are under attack. Moon 19 of Reuters writes that state-sponsored hacks on banks have rapidly increased, with Iran, China, and Russia conducting 23 attacks. These attacks are starting to leave a dent. Walters 19 of the Heritage Foundation writes that cyber intrusions will cost the global economy $2.1 trillion by the end of the year, more than quadrupling the 2015 total. The U.S.'s use of offensive cyber operations is at the heart of economic warfare for two reasons. First is through prompting retaliation. Delaney and 19 of NBC writes that Trump, empowered by Congress, has conducted more offensive operations in his first two years than in Obama's entire presidency. Other countries have taken note. Valeriano, 19 of Cato, writes that Trump has completely distorted cyberspace, catalyzing fear and a cycle of escalation where even the smallest intrusion could be interpreted as a national threat. Retali retaliating against the U.S. is feasible as Dinelli, 19 of Roll Call, establishes that U.S. computers are relatively defenseless in the case of an attack. This has already happened. Jin 19 of Yale writes that immediately after the U.S. hacked Iran military, they retaliated with a cyber attack on 46 different banks, causing millions of dollars in damage. Critically, this was not the case before the U.S. began to use offensive operations. Valeriano continues that before 2016, when Obama imposed regulations limiting offensive operations, other states rarely retaliated. Second is through shattering cooperation. Yannick 16, the AF Institute, explains that the U.S. has ramped up its cyber cooperation, signing an agreement with Russia, Europe, and India. Despite this, Lewis 15, the CSIS, explains that high levels of political distrust have gutted efforts, causing countries to suspect that agreements will not be adhered to. The reason comes from Valeriano, who continues that the Trump administration violates norms of restraint and has changed the rules of the global game of cyberspace to a more aggressive posture. When the United States, a global hegemon and norm setter, announces to the world that offensive hacking is encouraged, the first domino gets pushed over. For example, Moore 17 of Global Studies writes that our hack in Iran serves as a global wake up call for nations to put their hat into the cyber realm, with Britain, India, China, and other countries having no choice but to invest into cyberspace. Wan Sheng 19 of PDO puts it simply. The U.S. has directly triggered a global cyber arms race, causing a spiral of serious threats and risks to security. <clears throat> As the world engages in an arms race, no <coughs> country has enough trust to form agreements. Nations are less likely to agree to limit their own abilities if they cannot guarantee other nations will follow suit. Specifically, Goldsmith 11 of the Hoover Institute explains that no international agreement can be effective unless the United States clamps down on its own capabilities. He thus concludes that we aren't going to get restrained from our adversaries until we restrain ourselves. For example, Strobel 19 of the Wall Street Journal writes that although the U.S. signed an agreement with China to end economic hacking, China has been violating it for the past 18 months. International cooperation is critical, as Mar 18 of Carnegie writes that an agreement led by major economies to limit economic attacks sends a clear message to halt the intrusions. Both these reasons are bound to cause a major cyber hack on financial institutions and would devastate the impoverished around the world. Pisani 18 of CNBC writes that even a single bank can be systemically important, and due to global economic linkages, one hack could cause a ripple effect that devastates services across the world, leading to the next financial crisis. Overall, the IMF quantifies that the next major economic shock will push 900 million, 900 million people into poverty. Thus, we are so very proud to meet you.
the struggle the evidence says that the Chinese agreement has been violated for the past 18 months. And sure. And you want to just look at what? what? The agreement between Russia and India is. Oh, it's Russia, Europe, and India, sure. You can sort of. Yeah. Wait, what? Um, no, we just, that's just an example of agreements oh, being made. Agreement that doesn't say that those agreements go. We say agreements have failed from Goldsmith and the Chinese okay. agreement. Can I just do the evidence of those agreements? Oh, that's yeah. extra yeah. We already showed you one, and then yeah. Strobel's yeah. another one. Strobel's an expert. Just go ahead. Okay. At the top of your case, you tell me that U.S. cyber operations are going to prompt retaliatory attacks. Yep. Countries are only going to retaliate if they're certain of who they're attacking or who they <coughs> them previously, right? Like, we'd say that's like that could factor into their analysis. Well, but we'd say like the majority of the time, what do you mean? if you look to what's happened in the past, retaliation has happened when the U.S. has done cyber attacks. Yes, but that's only when they're certain the United States is doing it, correct? No. So they're just blindly like if they, attacking if they the United think, States? If they think the U.S. has done it, then they're going to retaliate. That's the question. Okay, so what does they think the United States mean? If they have like a like, I'd say like they don't have to be like a hundred percent certain that it was the United States, but if there's a pretty good probability that that's the case. There's a pretty high probability that. So what defines case. that probability? Like, what's the threshold to determine that? Okay, the United like, States. Like, I'm not like one of these actors. Like, I don't know the exact strategic calculus okay. that happens in their mind, but I'd say like for the for the most part, like if they like think that the U.S. is doing these attacks, which the U.S. has shown a propensity to to do in the past, it's pretty likely that they do in the future. They okay. retaliate. As well. you can okay, so. On the top of your contention, do you make, do you make the argument that like uh, offensive operations are an alternative to drone strikes? No. We say that offensive operations enhance drone strikes. Okay, so you're saying that drone strikes increase as a result, or? No. We're simply saying they become more accurate, meaning they kill fewer civilians, okay, so not should, propagating should anti-American sentiment, should casual, while still killing okay. terrorists. Should casualties from drone strikes have gone down like with an increased use of offensive operations in like Trump's campaign, or like Trump's presidency? Well, it's, yeah. Okay, so have casualties gone down as a result? Our evidence indicates that drone strikes have become more accurate. Compared to Obama's presidency, we contend that like drones, the ca number of casualties from drone strikes sure. has doubled but and way more sure. than like, anything in Obama's okay, presidency. Okay, sure, but what's critical is how many casualties per drone strike, right? It's not a matter of just quantity, it's a matter of how like frequent But you occurs. just said that it's the same number, just as more efficient, like more efficient like drone strikes, right? So like, is it more drone strikes or is it just like better drones? Like I'm just, I'm so confused as to what your link is here. Okay, so are you gonna argue that drone strikes have increased, or? I don't know, like, what's your link? I just wanna to respond to it. We're just saying it makes drone strikes, <coughs> whether that means that drone strikes have increased is like irrelevant to the argument. But you just said it's like per drone strike or something, so I'm just yeah, like confused. because they kill So are drone strikes things. like increasing? Sure. Oh, okay, okay. well, we can we talk about okay, that. Okay, great. Go. So, on your case, you talk about a cyber arms race. Yeah. Why did the United States develop cyber arms? Uh, we'd say there's like a bunch of different reasons. Like they want to just like develop like an increased capacity. But to, why like, did they want to? Like you obviously have an answer. How because you know? Russia had it first. So well, I'd say the United that States doesn't US, US, it. US, a still very powerful country okay, like your warrant quick? is develop these can I respond to that real quick? Yeah. I'd say like the main thing is like even if Russia had some sort of cyber capabilities in the past, like the US the rate at which they developed is like a lot bigger like a lot quicker than like what Russia's rate of development was, which is why they're the ones who are triggering the cyber arms race with Wait, all countries around that's the That's how your argument is. Your argument is that the presence of a strong government or like military power having these arms races, or like having these arms, sure, leads to other countries developing these arms. Yeah, doesn't I mean, that still US, happen the US Russia? specifically, no, we said the US specifically. So why doesn't that happen with Russia? Degree. It didn't happen with Russia, is that what, that's what I That's what led to the US, US well,
four rating mechanisms. First is uniqueness. There are a lot of other reasons why cyber attacks can cause economic collapse or cause banks to go. Which is, what, what our Hubbard evidence indicates is the U.S. has pulled out troops right now, which is the only way you counter terrorism in the status quo is through offensive cyber operations, which means we're always at wing on uniqueness. Second and more importantly, this time frame. Terror is happening right now. It's the most probable impact. Offensive cyber operations have happened for the last 10 years. We've never seen a huge recession due to a bank crisis like talk about. So you prefer us on time frame because it's happening right now is the most probable. But you also prefer us because it's intergenerational. Even if a recession happens, countries fundamentally recover from recessions. They always have good times of economic growth. The problem is terrorism is an intergenerational impact. It affects the structure of these economies because they can't generate any economic investment. So they're not in the developing cycle. That's always why terrorism comes first. Third, the people in developing countries that are affected by terrorism don't have advocates, whereas the people in these other countries do. Like in Iran and Russia, they always have negotiation powers. The countries always have an incentive to negotiate, which is why you always prefer the people who don't have an incentive to negotiate because there's no, there's no political stability in the region, which is why you're not going to see any alternative solvency for our, our harms. Fourth is the If there's no stability in the region, conflict becomes much more likely. Recessions become much more likely in times of conflict because countries are so focused on like the, uh, focused on like the actual conflict rather than um, rather than their economy. Now let's go to their case on the impact level. They read two cards at the bottom. One that says a cyber operation will lead to bank collapse, and one that says a recession causes 900 million people. Their bank's evidence never says the word recession in it. Call for it. They don't have an internal link to recession. Don't let them read a new link in, sec in second rebuttal or later. Then, more importantly, their IMF evidence about 900 million people going to poverty talks about a recession like the 2008 recession, where the U.S. had high economic growth and then collapsed. There's not high economic growth right now, which means they don't get access to the 900 million dollar evidence. You're mitigating that on scope, but then we still outweigh because you're fundamentally changing the development cycle of Africa's economy when you decrease terrorism because you allow more investment to come in. The U.S. will always recover because they always have an opportunity to get stimulus packages, whereas Africa will, will simply never not. Let's go down to the top of their case. They have two links. The first is about retaliation. Oh, sorry. The group their links realize this is all dependent on uh, defense because if we have better defense, it makes it more likely that we take out their impact. Three reasons why offense helps defense. First, you don't need the defense if you take out another uh, people, uh, another person's systems. Like if your offensive capabilities are able to take out an opponent's offensive capabilities, then you simply don't need defense and you mitigate the risk that your your, uh, your like power grid or your banks are attacked. Second, you're able to find vulnerabilities in your own defensive systems with an increased use of offensive cyber operations, which means you're able to patch those vulnerabilities, which means when you have an increased use of offensive cyber operations, you have a better defensive systems, which means it's less likely or it mitigates their impact. Third is on scope. Offense allows you to take out the conventional capabilities of other countries, whereas defense only allows you to take out the cyber capabilities of other countries. For example, offensive operations can take out the military compounds by hacking software there, but defense capabilities can only interact with, uh, with attacks that have happened to them. Top shelf responses. Their two links are dependent on proliferation of nuclear weapons, but there's two reasons why proliferation would have happened in either world. The first is the resolution of this question of use and not development, which means development would have happened in either world, triggering their attack. <coughs> second, more importantly, other countries will always have an incentive to proliferate these nuclear weapons for two reasons. A, even if these countries, uh, these countries always want an inherent up, an, an upper hand, like Ashton tells you in Cross, and more importantly, Russia developed before Russia developed these cyber capabilities before the U.S. did, which means other countries would have still developed cyber capabilities. On the link about retaliation. Um, seven reasons why retaliation isn't true. First, anonymity. The states cannot determine who's responsible and therefore don't know what retaliate against. The conflict just dies down and no escalation can take place. Um, it's Erica 15 finds that in the past there's been no escalation unless people are able to pinpoint cyber attacks. Second is delay times. Even if they do decipher it, it just takes too long. As Bogart 19 finds the country loses justification and interest to retaliate. The third is sanctions. The United States has a sanctions program which Nakashima 15 finds has been used more often to, to retaliate against cyber attacks. Fourth is adaptation. Countries can fix vulnerabilities in minutes. Even if a hostile nation wants to retaliate, they can't do any damage. Fifth is withholding. Cyber commanders continually hold on to their best cyber weapons so nobody knows. The actual set of what these cyber weapons can do. Six is politics. Good luck with the American government on this issue. It's politically, it's politically impossible to pass retaliatory policy. As Rotor 15 finds, this is the reason why we haven't passed retaliatory strikes. Three turns. First is deterrence. Often operations deter hostile nations from fighting conflict because they don't want to be the target of the next strike. As Golden 12 finds, this is the reason deterrence has worked. Second is preventing conventional warfare because Halo 19 finds that actors in the Middle East are using cyber operations as an alternative to conventional wars, and it includes their being used as a de escalator return. This is for these reasons. Um, Black 16 finds there hasn't been any uh, specific retaliatory attacks. On the link about shadowing cooperation, their uniqueness takes it out. They say international cooperations are happening right now. It's better if the U.S. is at the table than if the U.S. isn't. Sorry, we'll take
first wing is that there are multiple reasons that can cause a recession, but argument that the greatest risk and the one that could cause the massive shock is going to be a cyber attack. Your second argument is that terror is intergenerational, it lasts for a long time. First, we say that you can't get out of a recession because of a stimulus package, because if your banks are shut down, there's no way to get out of a recession. It is still intergenerational. But secondly, we fundamentally change the economy of these countries and we're keeping them in recession. It's the same extent as a terror. Third, they say that there's like no advocates in these countries. We are still affecting the countries that don't have any advocates. Where we're talking about an interconnected recession that affects everyone. Their fourth way is that it's prerequisite because of conflict. But a recession in Africa doesn't really do a recession across the world. Whereas you were targeting the pinpoint of the US economy, which is the pinpoint of the rest of the economy, which means that our recession always outweighs there. Let's go to our first warrant here. They talk about defense. The biggest problem here is that they don't explain or contextualize how defense is important in the first place. They just span like six responses here, but never once tell you how defense is actually going to be stopping anything in the status quo. Group all of them together. First, it's about the idea about the perception. Even if our defensive measures are good right now, my opponents have to be proven to you how attacks are increasing right now. Secondly, we would say that if at the point where attacks are increasing, that means that every one of the reasons why they give you about defense being good right now is not true. Trillions of dollars are being taken out of the economy. Their advocacy is not working. They read a blip about nuclear weapons. We didn't talk about nuclear weapons. Let's go to their argument about Russia being cyber. This is non-responsive. Even if Russia fills in, we say that the only country that countries want, actually want to listen to is the United States because the United States is the main norm setter. Group all seven responses there, all seven of like their things together. Once again, attacks are increasing right now. These are all hypothetical. If this were true, we'd see that attacks are going down right now. It's not the case right now. We're seeing trillions of dollars being taken out of the economy right now. They're really mishandling this new and this debate. On their turns, their first one is about deterrence. One, this is not contextualized at all. They don't explain to what extent deterrence works. This is literally like seven, like six seconds. But secondly, we'd say they're not weighing this deterrence at all. We said that deterrence is always greater in a, in a world in which we're like not, countries aren't afraid that we're about to strike them back. Their second argument is about an alternative to kinetic wars. This is not true. Once again, this is a link into their case. We said that drone strikes are increasing right now, which means clearly it's not an alternative to kinetic wars. We're going to be doing it no matter what. They say cooperation is happening right now. We say cooperation is not working right now because their agreements are being violated. On our impact level, they say our impact is not about a recession. It says a financial shock will happen. Pretty close to this definition of a recession. Then they say that 900 million people into poverty was based on like 2008 not growth. Call for the evidence. It just said that if a major economic shock happens, it'll push 900 million people into poverty. Let's go to their case. At the top level, the biggest thing that you need to be realizing is that they say that troops are decreasing right now, but that's not the case. Because what Holtweiter explains is that on balance, even though the troops are changing, they're just relocating the location of them. But on balance, troops are still increasing in the Middle East and to other locations. At that point, they are not going to be proving any urgency here. And we're saying that no matter what, they're always going to have the check back of US influence, which will always check back to there. But secondly, we'd say that if terrorism is going down the status quo, it's not for the measures that they talk about. There's a bunch of other reasons, like A, international backlash, B, domestic crackdown, like Iraq is already shutting down 90% of terrorist accounts in the country. That means that there's always going to be other reasons why terrorists are going down there. Not going to be giving you any uniqueness to linking it into this argument about OCOs. Then on the idea with drone strikes, the biggest thing to realize is what failure explains is that drone strikes are increasing by 432%. A couple of implications for this. A, it means that there's no trade off like they talk about. Even if it's true that they become more efficient, it doesn't matter because from the propaganda standpoint, all these other terrorist groups have to do is say, okay, drone strikes are increasing. It doesn't matter that they're de in decreasing in severity, even if they win that, because if on balance they're increasing, they're saying, oh, they've struck more bases, they've killed more people, on balance it's still an increase. But they're still losing the severity debate because what MERP explains that civilian casualties don't due to drone strikes have doubled under Trump. They are literally losing this uniqueness debate pretty badly. Let's go specifically about terrorists going online. This is not true. What Thaddeus explains is that ISIS can't even start a cyber, cyber terrorist unit because like the main recruiter and the main like the main head of the ISIS cyber terrorist division has already been killed, which is why the ISIS cyber terrorism that they talk about in their case is not working at all right now. Specifically on the idea about Boko Haram, what seriously explains is that Boko Haram is rapidly increasing right now and Nigeria is rapidly increasing. What the implication of this is is that if offensive cyber operations were effective, we would say that the Boko Haram would no longer be a problem. They're painting a false narrative here. Let's go to the power grid argument. What Barry explains is because that the US power grid is decentralized, you can't attack it and take down the entire power. He explains you have to shut down all nine nine generators physically, and that would require an all-out war that's not going to be happening there. Let's go specifically to their first impact about debts. We can say that this impact about debts is going to be happening no matter what, because if you take away one terrorist group, another one will fill in. You don't solve for the root cause, which is economic inequalities. We link into this argument. Their second argument, economic growth. First, they, even if you take out terrorism, there's other reasons that make it a bad climate for investment, such as like unpolitical uncertainty and the fact that their economies are run primarily on resource extraction. On their third impact about political stability, we would say that elections aren't bad because like there's terrorists there. Elections are bad because the U.S. forced elections in a, at a point when there's literally civil wars going down and like neo imperially just forced elections to happen when they weren't ready. No matter what, elections are going to be in a pretty bad situation in those countries and nothing's going to change.
this and this is the additional feature. So why do politicians use drones? Are they using drones because yeah. they like them? Like, well, why, do they like, why do they like them? It's like a way for them to attack other nations. So like, would it be fair to say that the reason like Republican politicians specifically like to use drones is because they want to look strong on terror without putting U.S. soldiers in harm's way? No, I feel like we use drone strikes no matter what. It's like Trump yeah, is no, really that's, that's completely our argument, right? So okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying that drone strikes are still increasing right now. So insofar as we are using drone strikes no matter what, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that they're becoming more efficient. Wow. Just to the point of the propaganda press, like all the terrorist groups have to say is, okay, U.S. is still increasing drone strikes. They bombed 40 different locations. Who cares if they bombed 40 different locations okay. and five? percent less people died. It matters about right. the fact that they're still so bombing more locations right. and still giving so them a reason to lash out. Sure, I, I understand that, right? But you're painting a false dichotomy with the comparative. In a world without OCOs, you would still have the exact same number of drone strikes from Trump. They would just be less effective. So you're telling me the effectiveness no. doesn't matter at all. Well, I'm telling you that if your argument was true, we wouldn't see that civilian casualties due to drone strikes have doubled no, since Trump. No, so double, no. The reason it's doubled since Trump is because Trump is a Republican president that increased drone strikes and okay. would have done it in either okay. world. Clearly, okay. right? Wait, did yeah. it didn't start the timer. Oh. Okay. All right, so, um, okay, yeah, the point that I think you're missing here is that, yeah, we can agree that drone strikes are increasing no matter what. The point I'm trying to make is it's not as, like, complicated, and it can't be as convoluted from the past, but from the, like, perspective of, like, for example, a terrorist group saying, okay, guys, listen up, here we go. It's, they've increased by 432%. Trust me, there's been, like, a 0.57% decrease in civilian casualties. Let's just, like, there's no more anti-American sentiment. Now, as, right, insofar right. as we are drone striking at an increased rate every single year, no matter how okay. better offensive operations make the drone strikes, okay. they're still going to be so, using anti-American so, okay. sentiment. So let, me just so let me just understand your argument so I can get from that. You're saying that, yes, drones get more effective, we're just going to launch a lot of drone no, strikes. They're not, they're not getting more effective. So what is your response to why they don't get more effective? What, what do you mean? Like, why they don't get more effective? Because yes. it doesn't matter if individual drone strikes like have a small likelihood of being more effective. Because in reality, when you're drone striking yes. areas, they're still going to be hurting okay. people. Okay. Like, they're, so, they're not going to be more so, effective. So your argument is that the individual drone strikes get more effective, but no. the rest of the overall <coughs> nothing becomes more effective. I'm not conceding any part of your case. If that's I, what you want me to do. But let me ask you. One. <laughs> okay. So let's get specifically about your idea about like economic growth. To what extent is terrorism limiting FDR? Um, we say that like a one standard deviation, like we showed the evidence, a one standard deviation increase in terrorist attacks leads to like a seven percent decrease in foreign direct investment. Okay, but even if like for example terrorism was not there, but aren't there other like reasons why investment wouldn't be there? Like you have that study, but right. I'm asking you from the warrants perspective. Even if you take away terrorism, there's still civil instability. Okay. There's still the fact so, that their economy is based off like taking okay. like that's like that's, out of the mind. sure that's like a real oversimplification of how like economics works. Obviously, if there's why? less terrorism, some investors are going to come back. To what extent is it going to get better? Well, we give you back. evidence. You're going to say that. If we, if we eliminate terrorism, there'll be like a 7% increase in Not eliminate terrorism, just like one standard deviation decrease in the number of terrorist attacks. Okay, so have terrorist attacks gone down in Africa? Yes. And that's how come Boko Haram has gone up? The FBI has gone up in Africa. You yes. Have been Africa has gone yes. Up. So what has happened as a result of that? Development. Like, yeah, Africa's, like what yeah. happened in development? Like what exactly? Like, I, mean, I don't know, I have evidence that says Africa has seen an increase in FDI. The, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that like, even if there's like, a little bit increase in terrorism, the FDI is going to be remaining largely the same no matter what. Uh, can I see something real quick? Yeah. Um, just like whatever you said, um, in the, in the, like, this offense defense compared. Like in response what? to offense? Yeah. Right? Like what's the bridge? I see something about the like, perception. So, like, what? So you have to like, offense is preferable to defense. Like you get two responses. Yeah, I just said perception is still that attacks are happening. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, can I see like attacks increasing? What attacks are increasing? Like you say, cyber attacks are increasing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can just yeah. look at that. Also, yeah. 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 Yeah.
and after that, I can see it's like the financial card. Or the, the internal link into a financial account. Yeah. Didn't I, we already showed you that? Yeah. Okay, you still have it. Okay, yeah. See the evidence that says because the bank shut down, there's no stimulus package. We just don't okay. Yeah. So we're going to start on the ass case and go to Wayne, then the neck case. Everyone good? Start at the far top of our flow. They say in response to U.S. pullout that, Trump, that troops have simply been relocated. We look at their evidence. It's not about the Middle East, it's, or like not about regions struck by terrorism, it's the Persian Gulf. We'd say they're not going to be combating terrorism. But second, their own evidence says to us that this pullout of, from Trump in like these regions is ultimately going to lead to an ISIS resurgence. We say you call for it. It's really bad. But then second, they say there are other ways, ways of like stopping terrorism. One, their own evidence says that like this Trump, U.S. pullout is ultimately going to lead to a resurgence. We'd say you buy their evidence there that ultimately flows out. But then on Africa, this goes cold conceded. They simply say that Boko Haram has increased. But since they don't respond to our actual link, we'd say that ultimately it would have been a lot worse in their world without offensive cyber, uh, cyber operations through this tech transfer, which ultimately means that Africa would have been less able to combat terror, ultimately meaning Boko Haram's like, impacts would have been a lot worse. But then second, they completely drop funding. What this means is a couple things. In the long term, terrorists won't have the money to actually perform these terror attacks as a long term solution. But second, in response to this idea of like to other terrorists, like even if one group shuts down, there's simply a fill-in, we'd say as long as we shut down their funding while they're still small, there's a long term solution that means we're ultimately the only side 
side that has any chance of solving for terrorism because their own evidence concedes that. But now into the impacts, a couple ways you can be voting for us. Like on their point on death, they simply say that others fill in, we responded to that. Second on economics, they say that the reason why the, like, the economy is bad is because of political uncertainty. We tell you we solve for that. Let's get to the, our third impact about political stability. They say that like the United States forces these elections, but we specifically tell you the United States protected elections in Nigeria against Boko Haram, improving their democracy. We say that's critical for two reasons. One, it means that these democratic nations are less likely to go, go to conflict because their leaders are more rational. And two, it ultimately means that they're like, it increases investor confidence, benefiting the economy like our second impact. But now to the weighing. We'd say that we're the only form of solvency for terror is OCOs. They say that there's like the greatest risk of recession. Like the comparative is that like, um, that it's because of a cyber attack. We'd say recessions are cyclical and stimulus is always possible. They, these banks only shut down temporarily. But second, we are, we'd also say that outside forces, like intervening factors are always going to create this stimulus for the United States because they have a vested interest in them. Then you vote for us on time frame because terrorism is happening right now. All these bank collapses aren't. But second, we'd say that terrorism is also intergenerational. This bank collapse is temporary, whereas everything else we talk about will continue to exist unless you intervene, like on these issues. But then on to this point about like no advocates, they simply say that they solve for like countries because they have like weak economies. We'd say, no, that's not true. You have to solve for an intent. We'd say the only way to do so is to solve back for terror. And then also stability like in increases conflict in the long term. The only way to solve this is by getting rid of terrorist groups and having more democratic elections. Now to their flow. They completely mishandled this offense versus defense overview that Silver reads to you. One, we'd say it doesn't matter if attacks are occurring as long as one, offensive operations take out opponent oper uh, offensive operations taking away the need for defense. Two, it solves for vulnerabilities in our defense, meaning even if they attack, we're still prepared. And three, it takes out conventional means, which, uh, like, um, which ultimately is going to be better for us because then that means we can combat all the issues. They completely dropped the non-unique on Russia, which says that like this development would have happened no matter what. Ultimately, this flows out because when this occurs, every impact they talk about is going to happen regardless because people are still going to build up cyber arms. Thank you. Please refer.
just going to be addressing their weighing RK samples. Sound good? Start with the weight. They first gave you this uniqueness weight, the same that recessions happen all the time, but terrorism is like specifically unique. But you're telling the Goldsmith evidence that cyber recession is worse than a normal recession, which is why it's gonna be a lot worse in our world because you can't access the banks, you can't access the stimulus package to get back out. But then on time frame, they say that like offensive operations will like cause like have no cause for recession. But we say that A, offensive operations have only increased like a lot recently, but B, we're on the brink of a recession happening in the very near future, at the point where trillions of dollars being taken out of the economy. Beyond that, they try to make the argument that terrorism within, uh, terrorism intergenerational. We we'd say without a stimulus a recession will, will last for a very long time. Time, mean that poverty from a recession will be intergenerational as well. But then they say that no advocates for victims of terrorism. We'd say that a recession affects everyone across the world to interconnect to the global economy, which means that we're still going to be impacting the countries that don't have advocates. And then beyond that, they like try to extend the like, prerequisite. But we'd say the conflict still exists, but it's, like, it doesn't really respond. But then uh, like extend our argument where we tell you the state sponsored attacks are increasing with trillions of dollars being lost in the global economy. And uh, America's use of offensive operations causes a hacker at first link by retaliation. We tell you that Trump's increased use of offensive operations caused distorted cyberspace, catalyzing fear and escalation, and leads to retaliation from a bunch of different actors. We tell you the specific example for, that Jim gives you that when we hacked Iran, Iran responded by hacking 46 banks, and we tell you that you know this argument is true because Valerie Yana finds there's limited reta retaliation before 2016 when Obama regulated offensive operations. We in fact this out to global recession because due to global interconnectedness, shutting down one bank could lead to a widespread recession, putting 900 million people into poverty. They have a couple of responses. They first in the overview, they said that offensive operations are good for like shutting down stuff, but then you can just group these responses to the point where attacks are still increasing right now. You're not showing to any extent how we're shutting down other, other countries' offensive operations. This just isn't true. Beyond that, they say they have tried to bluntly extend that we take out conventional means, like, and we, we have no incentive to start a war, and beyond that, we say that drone strikes are uh, increasing like, rapidly right now, but beyond that, they try to extend, like, uh, this Russia, like, developing, like, uh, starting an arms race through ink, we, like, just saying we drop it doesn't mean we actually drop it, we say that the U.S. is the main norm center, and they're the main ones who constantly like, spurring the development of arms all across the country. A couple reasons why you prefer this argument. The first one is on prerequisite, we tell you the poor economic Poor economic conditions are, conditions are the root of instability, which breeds terror. It means that terrorism is always going to be worse in the world where there's a recession. So, uh, like our argument always comes before theirs. And then on scope, we impact to every country around the world, where there's a few hotspots in like Africa and like uh, like wherever ISIS is. And then beyond that, we see that uh, authoritarianism always increases in the times of political and like, financial instability. Look at Germany, the aftermath of World War One, when Hitler and the Nazi Party like took rise and like preying off like a, a financial instability that was like there as a result. If you buy the political instability and like democracy is a really good thing, it goes down to their world. But a couple reasons why their arguments don't really apply. The the first of which is like on this argument of like at least like uh, on this argument of like troops, we say that the troops are increasing in places across the world, solving back for it. They say like our arguments like really like our evidence is really bad, but the evidence still says that like the troops are still increasing, regardless of the good or bad, that's what's happening historically. They can't prove to you otherwise. But beyond that, we say the effects of terrorism are still increasing right now. Look to Boko Haram, whose attacks and like the deaths caused by Boko Haram are increasing in the status quo. They just say the tech transfer is all back, but A, they don't explain like what to what extent it's all back, B, they don't warrant to like how tech trans transfer is all back. This like isn't extended in summary at all, and like C, there's like, no, not contextualizing the route, and then beyond that, on the impact, like they just talk about this idea of funding. We say they just turn to other things, like uh, like ran oil ransom and espionage, and beyond that, they don't contextualize to what extent like funding is important for terrorism. We just say like um, if we should, like um, overall like our case solves that better. Are you guys ready for my thoughts? Yeah. <coughs> Everyone good? Mm -hmm. Is there a question? Um, okay. So talking about this idea about funding. So like, I'm just confused, like how does offensive cyber operations shut down like all the forms of funding that they use? Oh, I mean, this is kind of like your thought, but basically the argument is just I mean, they take yeah. out the banks. Okay. And like they take out, like they freeze ISIS assets, that would be the case of the Okay, that's fine. So it's like their means of acquiring. Like, like the point we're trying to make is that like, what if you freeze one thing, can't they just turn to another thing? Like, okay, yeah, okay. then you can like freeze that. Yeah, like we freeze their like, everything. Like, we freeze their like financial assets. So their like, financial they, assets are so diversified. Like, how do you stop wait, so, everything? Right. So sure. that's what that's our point. Right now, in the status quo, you can't solve it because they're diversified. Targeted cyber operations what? because they're all directed to but a central. How? Group. How do you how do you okay. stop the diversification? So, like, okay. Okay. I, I really think that you like can't respond to a grand cross this argument. Like, if you don't want to defend your warrant, you don't have to. But like, I'm I'm just I'm just talking about the idea that like it's just like the general idea that we like. Like, literally right. almost destroyed so terrorism in the past and they just keep right. popping back. I so we have had, wait, wait, hold it, I just want to clarify. Like, sure. this is not necessarily a new response because we read the argument about how you don't solve for the root of terrorism. So insofar yeah. as there are economic inequalities, sure. a new wait. one will come in. Yeah, yeah, okay, no, okay, so here. So the first thing you said was about, well, the way it was contextualized in the second summary is that they can shift to oil and other resources. You probably sure. have to hold on, let, let me get the When you're selling oil, you still have to put the money into your banks to like, use it, right? So you're still gonna like use the banks with these freezing out. You don't need, need the banks. Second, 
you talk about um, what was the second thing you said? We don't solve for the root cause of like yeah, poverty, even, like even like even because right? like because like there have been like poor economic conditions in these places right. all the time. Like so their finances have right, not always so, been like insured, okay. but they still come back. I understand. So it's like kind of like a cart for the horse scenario, right? We need to spur economic development. So the perceptual link we read in case about investor confidence. So, in so you rely on your second. You have to win your second impact in order for you to win your link. That's no, that no, that's that's not an argument, right? Your response to why the root of the impact like, that was on the impact level. What you responded, right? Like, no. We still decrease terrorism to some extent because we take out their capacity. Right? No, our response is that even if you take out their capacity in this way, they've had their capacity taken out in the past, and they just come back because the root of the problem is economic right. inequality. So if okay. one group gets eliminated, another right. one will come okay. in. Okay. That's the sure. point. No, our argument is that the short-term effects of you taking out their capacity means investors come back. That solves for your like impact about poverty in the long term, no, which links back in. How? Why? Feedback. No. What no, because, goes, no, because even if, because even if in the short term investors come back and they're like, okay, terrorists are gone for like a few days. If they come back in the long term, they're gonna go away. So like you're in the, in the long run, you're not linking into our argument at all. Okay, you I mean, question. yeah, okay, I'll take the question. So you guys talk about this stuff about like how defense, like defense trade off we read at the top doesn't apply because yeah. attacks are increasing now. Yep. And um, we're kind yeah. of confused as to so your argument. Why right, you, you never read a card to pinpoint like the, the reason the attacks are increasing is because our defense is bad or our well. No, 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 your argument here is <coughs> offensive operations mean the other like it takes out the opponent's like uh, no, no, uh, adversaries like capabilities and like uh, uh, like ability to attack. Right. That's no, so our, 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 our argument. That's like, a your argument. No, no, that is. But our argument's like a bit broader. Right? I think you're kind of like misinterpreting. What we're saying basically is in a world without offensive cyber operations, our defenses would be much worse, which means your impact. No, because impact. we read the ballerina evidence. Which explains that before 2016, escalation was not a thing, so that takes out their response as well. Summary and our case there is. Is everyone good? Let's start on the Wayne debate. Their response for the weakest evidence is that Trump has been pulling out troops and that they're, uh, the, this recession, particularly through cyber attacks, is a lot worse. The problem is they don't contextualize how much worse it gets because of cyber attacks. We would say fundamentally, recessions in bad times of economic growth are always going to happen, which is always going to increase. The only chance you have to solve back for it is through like economic growth, sorry, it, it's through terrorism in these developing countries, which they concede are more important because they don't have social safety nets. The time run wing has also dropped. What they tell you is that increased use of retaliation. But the problem is, what we tell you is that specifically, terrorism is happening right now. You're seeing a decrease in terrorism right now because of an increased use in office cyber operations that means you have the your biggest probability in round because you're always evaluating first on the prerequisite wing they say it doesn't matter because a recession affects like the entire world the problem is this analysis is once again taken out by the non-unique recessions will always happen to some capacity which means uh, bad times of economic growth always going to happen the only way you fundamentally change africa's economy is by spurring economic growth and we say one of the ways you do that is by decreasing terrorism let's go to their way they just do they say a pre pre it's a prereq because economic growth is the root cause of terrorism sure economic growth may be the root cause of terrorism but you if you solve for the impacts of terrorism in the short term, you still spur economic growth in the short term, which means you're just pulling Africa out, which means in the long term, their impacts don't materialize because less people are turning to terrorism. The second thing they say is that authoritarianism goes up, but we give you specific evidence to do how this is going to change in our world because the U.S. is able to protect elections. This evidence goes clean drop in summary, which means you're extending our election war from Bagra, which indicates that the U.S. is able to protect elections through often cyber operations because Boko Haram has been trying to take down elections. This increases political stability and increases investor confidence because when you have more democratic leaders, investors are more confident in their rational incentives and they're not going to go to conflict. The second thing they drop is our argument about tech transfers. What they say, the only thing they say is that we don't contextualize what tech transfers are. We contextualize it very specifically. The only line of evidence indicates that Nigeria and the U.S. are collaborating through offensive cyber operations. And what this indicates from sales is that it decreases its capabilities in terms of funding from these terrorist groups. When you take out the funding that these terrorist groups have, you take out their capacity, which links in immediately to our impacts about economic stability, economic growth. A one standard deviation decrease in terrorism leads to a seven percent increase in foreign direct investment, which spurs Africa's growth to the point where four hundred million people are pulled out of poverty, linking. Back into the back into the terrorism argument, creating a feedback loop where terrorism is solved only in our world.
on the overview. Saying we dropped it does not mean that we actually dropped it. We have front frontlined every single response they make. The first thing that they talk about a recession being inevitable. Goldsmith tells you that the recession due to a cyber recession would be way worse than the inevitable one because it's harder to get out of the recession, which means that fundamentally it will still be a worse recession in their world. Then they try to argue this argument about terrorism is intergenerational. Once again, they are just dropping what we are saying. We say that the recession will still be intergenerational if you can't get out of the recession. But at the end of the day, these are just reasons why terrorism is more important than recession. If we can still prove that the recession links into terrorism, we are still winning the round. Let's talk about how we are doing that. First, our argument is that recessions, the, the economic attacks on banks are increasing right now with 23 attacks done in the last few years according to Moon taking trillions of dollars out of our global economy. We are waiting for our first warning about retaliation where Valerino tells you that Trump has distorted the rules of cyberspace and have catalyzed fear and escalation. You know this is true because Jin tells you that when we hacked Iran they responded with hacks on 46 different banks and Valerino explains that this was not the case before 2016 which takes out most of their overview in the first place. On the recession argument, Bassani explains that if you do global interconnectedness, one bank going down can lead to a financial shock across the world which the IMF tells, you push, tells you pushes 900 million people into poverty. They just keep extending this idea about this like defensive overview, but our argument is that it doesn't matter about this defensive overview because fundamentally, even if it was true that defense helps a little bit, we still say that trillions of dollars are being taken out of the economy, which is still a reason why their advocacy is not working the status quo. On the UN debate, here's where we're winning the round. The first one is on the idea that the prerequisite and that economic inequalities are the roots cause of terrorism, which my opponents agree with. Then they try to respond to this by saying that they cause a short-term boost in economic growth. This is a reason for you to sign your ballot for the negative ballot or the, for the negative side because they are saying that they're only a short-term solution. We are a longer-term solution because if you lead to an intergenerational um, um, recession that gets solved that for versus just a short-term boost in FDI, we still affect more countries that have terrorism. But the third form of brain, which is authoritarianism, is even more important because they mishandle this. They just say in response to this, the Boko Haram stuff, our argument is that if you spread economic inequalities across the world, authoritarianism spreads across the world, which destroys their political stability of the market, destroys their economic response, and at that point, the round is so clean because we affect more countries than they do. But specifically on their argument about the, like, the funding, they just drop Ashwin's response from summary when we said that they'll turn to other funding sources. They just didn't respond to it, and they just like, I mean, at that point, their argument's probably not true. Um, okay.